Welcome back. So I've been telling you a lot about sparsity and compressed sensing and this idea that as long as your signal uh, that you're trying to estimate has patterns like an image or an audio signal, you can get away with surprisingly few measurements if there's some element of randomness to how you're measuring that system. Okay, now today I'm gonna tell you about a little bit of a different perspective on sparse sensing for classification tasks. So if my goal is not to reconstruct a full image, but rather to classify what's in the image, you can get away with a lot fewer measurements. So that's what I wanna talk about. We've seen this picture before that um, the reason kind of compressed sensing works in general is because pixel space, kind of the space of possible signals, is absolutely astronomical. It's bigger than astronomical of all possible images that you could ever see. And natural images, the images that we as humans care about, live in a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of image space. And it's diffuse and spread out around image space, but natural images occupy a minuscule, almost unimaginably small fraction of pixel space, even though image space itself is unimaginably large. All of your human existence and everything you could ever see lives here, but it's still tiny compared to the vastness of image space. And that was how we thought about why um, kind of compressed sensing was possible at the first place. And so I should point out that uh, this lecture is gonna follow ideas from this paper, uh, 2016 paper in the Siam Journal of Applied Math by uh, my wife Bing Brunton, myself, Josh Proctor, and Nathan Kutz. So you can kind of read there for a lot more mathematical details on what we're gonna talk about. But the basic idea is that if we're not trying to reconstruct a full image, if we're not trying to get a high resolution reconstruction of what's in our image, let's say we only want to classify what's in our image. So instead of trying to determine what exact dog, what exact picture of a dog we have or what picture of a cat, I just want to do a binary classification. Is there a dog or is there a cat in my image? Is it a dog or is it a cat? And so this idea that if all we wanna do is classify what's in our image, you can get away with many, many, many fewer measurements than if you had to reconstruct the image. And this is what we call enhanced sparsity for decision making. Okay, and in fact, I, uh, the algorithm that we introduced is called SPOC, Sparse Sensor Placement Optimization for Classification, SPOC. Okay, and it's the, based on this idea that if all you want is a classification of your image, you can get away with many fewer uh, sensors or pixels than if you wanted to reconstruct. So the idea is, I don't care if my, you know, if the picture of the dog is a, a bulldog or a shih tzu, that's kind of perpendicular to this line. I don't care about any information that's perpendicular to this decision line. Uh, I don't care what type of cat I have over here. All I care about are the features that maximally tell me the difference between dogs and cats, okay? And so that, that's the basic idea here. And I'm gonna walk you through the algorithm. It's actually a very simple uh, algorithm, and we have some variants, and there's been some follow-up papers since, but in its simplest formulation, it's, it's quite intuitive how this works, okay? So this is Bing, this is her paper. Uh, you know, I helped out, but, but I'm kind of uh, walking you through, through her 2016 paper. So this idea of targeted sensor placement for classification, I'm gonna walk through on two examples, kind of the dogs and cats examples, and then the eigenfaces example. So the idea is you have a really big training data set. So again, they we're always thinking about this in kind of the machine learning way, that you have a big training data set, and you're gonna do some offline training to learn features about your data, and then you're gonna use that to make a really fast or really good online decision with less information potentially. So here I have uh, my, my dogs and cats library, so a bunch of cats, a bunch of dogs. Here I have my, my faces library. This is only a small subset of many thousands of images of people's faces, and the first step that you do is you run something like a singular value decomposition or a principal component analysis to find some low dimensional feature space that describes your data. Okay, so over here uh, you have your eigen faces, here you have your eigen pets. Okay, so you can really nicely describe this data by only a few uh, orthogonal vectors or orthogonal images in these eigen pets and eigen faces space. So maybe your faces had, you know, 100,000 pixels. Here you can get away with a hundred eigenfaces. Here your dogs and your cats maybe had 30,000 pixels in these images. I can get away with 10 or 20 eigenpets, 
Okay, and that's given by this, this matrix psi. This is literally uh, from the singular value decomposition that maps my high dimensional image into a low dimensional space. And then what you're counting on is that in this low dimensional space of eigenpets or, or eigenfaces, your categories separate. So you're, you're counting on dogs and cats kind of separating, being separate clusters in this, in this feature space, in this pattern uh, extracted eigenspace. And so if that's true, if your dogs and your cats live in different regions and kind of separate or cluster uh, in this in this, uh, in this case, in my eigenpet space, then you can use our Spock algorithm. Okay, so this is, uh, it's a lot of ifs, but a lot of systems, this is true. This is how image classification used to work before deep neural networks, is you would take your data, you'd map into some feature space like eigenfaces, and you would basically cluster your data and define these decision lines where you could separate your data and make decisions. That's how support vector machines works. That's how Fisher discriminant works, linear discriminant analysis, lots and lots of classical uh, image classification techniques are based on this, uh, this idea. Okay, so I uh, hope you're following. You have dogs and cats, you pull out their features, and in that feature space they cluster into these kind of groups of dogs and cats, and you could design a line, a decision boundary, that would tell you if you're on one side you're a cat, if you're on your other side you're a dog. Okay, and we define that decision boundary, we define the line that maximally separates these two clusters by uh, this vector w in feature space. Okay, uh, and we get this using the linear discriminant analysis, but you could use other techniques. And then the last step here is that once you have these clusters in feature space that are separated by this vector w, you can run this optimization algorithm at the top, and this is almost exactly like the compressed sensing algorithm. It's an L1 minimized regression problem where you're trying to make, um, you're, you're trying to fit your, your, your data, your observations. And what we're doing is we're getting a sparse vector S that is the same size as the original image, but the individual pixel locations in S tell you where is best to measure for this classification task. And here, in the case of my, my eigenpets and eigenfaces, these are where the red sensors uh, fall out of the data. And it's really interesting, these are extremely intuitive placements. So the sensors for the cat are in the eyes, the ears, the snout, that's where kind of the cat and the dog are the most different, or the eyes, the nose, and the, and the ears. For humans, you also get a lot of sensors in the corners of the eyes, corner of the nose, regions where there's a lot of variability and where different people look very different, okay? And we didn't tell the algorithm anything, we didn't say that these are humans or dogs or cats, we just gave examples of the data. We gave examples of dogs and cats, we ran singular value decomposition or principal components to get the features, and then we, we plotted this data in this low dimensional space to find out that it did in fact cluster. And since it clustered, we could find this discriminant line and determine these optimal sensor locations for that classification task. So I wanna talk a little bit about dimensions because I think this will help you understand a little bit more. Let's say that this is, I'm just gonna make numbers up uh, kind of uh, at random here. Let's say that all of my pictures over here are megapixel images, they have a million pixels, okay? And let's say that over here I can get away with 20 eigen cats and dogs uh, for a good classification, okay? So this is a million pixels, this is a 20 dimensional feature space. So when I map into that 20 dimensional feature space, I'm doing this classification on those 20 numbers of kind of what is my mixture of those 20 eigenpets that make up each of those high res images. So this is a 20 dimensional space, and W is a vector in 20 dimensions. So what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to find a full resolution image that when I map it into this feature space, it is, gives me the most information in this W direction because that's where all of my classification information is happening is in this W direction. I don't care about anything perpendicular. I don't care about what kind of dog or what kind of cat. I just care about the information that separates them. And so by running this optimization to find the sparsest S possible that reconstructs my decision vector when mapped into feature space, that's how we're pulling out uh, this vector S that has these non-zero, these 20 non-zero entries, 
And because we have a 20-dimensional feature space, we generally get 20 non-zero entries in S, uh, corresponding to the absolute best locations to measure for this classification task. Now, this is a really cool idea, um, and we've applied this to lots of systems since, and it seems to work uh, quite well. Something interesting that Bing did um, is she, you can do this with a kind of random reshuffling. So I'll just walk you through this again. So this was a large library of eigenfaces. So what you can do is you can take 80% of your data at random, train this algorithm, get uh, 20 sensors. Then do another random 80% train and get another 20 sensors. You can do that over and over and over again. And you can plot an ensemble of where those sensors are most likely to appear. And this is what that ensemble looks like uh, for the eigenfaces. So it starts to patch out kind of this ghosty outline of human features of what you would look at. Uh, and there's classical results uh, from the 60s, this Yarbis result, where they did eye tracking. They showed people pictures of human faces and tracked where their eyes look at to determine who that, that person is. And you can see that where the human eye spends the most time is very similar to where our algorithm spends the most time, okay? So I think that's really kind of a neat, uh, a neat connection uh, between kind of classical results in human uh, vision and, and cognition and this kind of modern machine learning perspective of if you trained an algorithm to pick the best sensors, they would actually get a lot of the same features that a human does. Okay, so this is a really powerful algorithm. You can use this for classification tasks, and instead of needing you know, 10,000 or 100,000 random pixel measurements for compressed sensing, we can get away with 20 pixels and classify really, really accurately, you know, dogs versus cats or different types of different uh, individual humans. I will point out that this does in fact require that the images are cropped and aligned if you're gonna use singular value decomposition or principal components as the features. But if you're willing to do something uh, a little fancier for your feature space, you might be able to get around uh, some of those limitations. So, so in principle, you could embed this into neural network architectures uh, and other classification algorithms that are a bit more powerful. Okay, uh, so the last thing I wanna point out, and I think this is just really fun, uh, is that we didn't start thinking about sparse sensor placement and classification at random, okay? This was not just uh, you know, a random research topic. We got interested in this because of this kind of bio-inspired sensing that we observe in insects. So, and I'll, I'll almost certainly do um, kind of a whole lecture on this at some other point about bio-inspired sensing, but I'll just give you a little high level right now. There's this idea that, um, not an idea, it's an observation that all flying insects have on the order of tens to hundreds of strain-sensitive neurons on their wings. So if you look with a microscope at a moth wing or a fruit fly wing, there will be lots and lots and lots of these tiny, tiny, tiny strain sensitive neurons. So they're literally neurons that are in the wing. So when the wing bends at a certain temporal pattern or a certain, uh, if it bends a certain way in time, these neurons fire, ions get squeezed into a, a nerve ending and those neurons fire and all of that information goes up into uh, the central nervous system of this flying insect, and it uses that information to help it fly better, okay? And we're still trying to unravel kind of the neural flight control system of flying insects. It's, it's almost as if we have an alien, uh, an alien spaceship landed on Earth, and we're gonna try to reverse engineer how it flies. That's what these flying insects are to us. And so there's this observation that these insects can do extremely sophisticated maneuvers and flight control uh, in timescales that are faster than its information goes to its brain. So its visual information or these sensors have time to go to its brain and back to the muscles. And so what we believe is happening is that these sensors are going directly into a local computation in its kind of shoulder muscle, and then it's doing some local computation and deciding immediately what to send back to its, its, uh, its muscles, okay? So it's kind of bypassing the brain and doing this really fast local computation based on these uh, strain-sensitive neurons. And so I think this is a fascinating problem. We've been trying to understand for years, kind of reverse engineer, why would it put its sensors here? These are not in random locations. They're in very stereotyped, very reproducible locations. Um, 
what is it trying to estimate? Why is it placing its sensors there? Are they optimal locations? Um, all kinds of questions you can ask to reverse engineer the system. And then also, can we take wing technology from a moth and can we use it in our everyday engineering life? Can we learn how to sense systems better, more efficiently, and do local computations based on this uh, kind of sparse sensing paradigm of flying insects? So those are all super interesting questions. Uh, that's kind of where this idea of sparse sensor optimization for classification came from, is we were trying to think, you know, okay, you have a moth flying, maybe it just wants to know am I rotating or not? That's a classic hypothesis of what it could be using those strain-sensitive neurons for. Uh, and we kind of took that idea and mapped it into this general mathematical framework where you can start thinking about uh, generic classification tasks and how you would target optimized sensors for those classification tasks. So there's a lot more under the hood, a lot I'm not telling you about. Uh, if you want to know more, please do read our papers. Uh, check out chapter three of our new book, Data-Driven Science and Engineering, by myself and Nathan Kutz. Uh, there will be a link in the comments uh, to code, to PDF, uh, and if you find this useful, please like, please subscribe, uh, hit the bell, and let me know what you want me to talk about and, and tell you more about. All right, thank you.